What are basically the new approaches? Well, the first thing is that we realized in recent years that a lot more of the pain syndromes in uh, oncological patients are neuropathic in, in origin or neuropathic in type. Um, previously, we thought that up to 70-80% of all pain symptoms were somatic from uh, etiology and somatic pain responds well to classical analgesic or classical opioids, uh, but now it's said in the literature that up to 50-60% of all pain uh, symptoms are neuropathic in origin or mixed neuropathic with visceral, neuropathic with somatic or neuropathic and visceral and uh, somatic. And that requires a completely different uh, approach to pain. If you want to treat pain, well then in most of the patients you need a multimodal approach. Uh, one golden bullet doesn't work. You have to combine different analgesic with different uh, targets and with different mode uh, of action. And then it's important, of course, that you know what analgesic or what uh, analgesic and adjuvant can be uh, combined. Certainly, very new is that we move more and more towards a topical treatment. Uh, we now really realize that up to 15-20% of all pain uh, syndromes are very localized eh? and the, it's called the localized neuropathic pain syndromes and it's the area of an R4 page. If you can cover the painful area with an R4 page then it's defined as a localized neuropathic pain and we now have several treatment options that you can uh, treat this pain topically uh, and so you avoid the systemic side effects, you avoid the interactions of the different uh, drugs and we will talk about it also later. Certainly cancer is becoming more and more chronic uh, syndrome so we are faced now with very long lasting uh, treatment and the big new uh, population in chronic pain patients are the cancer survivors. Okay? We didn't treat that 20 years ago, now it's uh, increasingly and it puts some challenges to our pain uh, treatment. Okay? And finally, it's not easy, but sometimes we have also to take uh, a preemptive approach. Okay? If you know that a patient needs a thoracotomy or needs an amputation, you know that the patient is at a very high risk of developing chronic pain, well, then you can start the treatment with gabapentin or with an epidural or with other uh, pharmacology uh, before the insult occurs, before the surgery is done or before the radiotherapy is done in order to prevent or decrease the occurrence and the intensity of the chronic pain uh, syndrome. This is an overview of the somatosensory system in normal uh, conditions. You have the site of the injury, it can be everything, it can be radiotherapy, it can be chemotherapy, it can be a skin lesion due to a, a surgical procedure. The nociceptors become activated with the peripheral sensitization. There is a transmission of the nociceptive signal towards the dorsal horn and a lot of the pharmacological uh, therapies will focus or will act at the level of the dorsal horn. Uh, and then there is a transmission toward the central uh, nervous system and only when the signal arrives at the cortex there is a perception of pain. So in the meanwhile we have a lot of targets that we can work on in order to decrease the occurrence of pain or the intensity of pain. Uh, most of our treatment options are focused on transmission, like for example with the local uh, anesthetics, or focused on the modulation. Uh, both at the periphery as in the dorsal horn, we can decrease the intensity of the pain uh, signal, uh, whereas a lot of normal um, physiological modulation effects will increase the intensity of the nociceptive uh, signals. That's something that we can try to uh, reverse into a decrease of 
the uh, intensity. I will not tell you a lot about the, the pathophysiology of uh, pain or chronic pain, but just two, three slides to show you the, the main targets where we focus on. This is the dorsal horn with the transmission coming from the A delta and C fibers from the periphery to the second order uh, neurons. And you see that there are basically two major receptor systems involved into the transmission. That's the AMPA receptor and the NMDA uh, receptor eh, with sodium channels and calcium channels. Eh. And if you see that, you immediately understand why we use a lot of uh, anticonvulsant drugs eh, because they act on the sodium channel system and on the calcium channel system. And that's the big success of the gabapentinoids. Eh, the gabapentin, the pregabalin, it exerts its effect in the transmission at the level of the dorsal horn and can shut down or can decrease the intensity of the activation of the NMDA receptor. The NMDA receptor is crucial. If we could shut down the NMDA receptor, then we could probably uh, increase our efficacy in analgesic treatment by, uh, by a large uh, factor, but until now we are not uh, able to completely shut down the NMDA uh, receptor. Why is it so important? Well, it will induce a lot of uh, symptoms and certainly it's crucial for the development of the central sensitization. If the NMDA receptor is being activated during a longer period of time, then a central sensitization will occur and even if in the periphery at the side of the injury at the side of the surgical wound the nociceptors calm down the somatosensory signals will continue to develop here and will be transmitted to the central nervous system and the, and the patient will continue to feel pain it's not by an injury it's by the activation of the NMDA uh, receptors. Eh? And it leads to a lot of syndromes, eh? the hypalgesia, the hypersensitivity of the patient, the allodynia, the patient that will feel pain from non-noxious stimuli, wearing uh, gloves, wearing socks. Uh, they, they can't take a shower because just the, the drops of the water on their skin will be painful, well, that is induced by this continuous NMDA uh, activation. Uh, Fifteen years ago, everybody thought that you needed a couple of weeks or even perhaps a month of continuous NMDA activation before you would start a central sensitization. Now we know that in some patients, a couple of days is enough to enter the central sensitization state. So in a couple of days, they move to a chronic pain uh, state. That's the reason why new uh, pain symptoms need to be uh, treated aggressively in order to decrease the occurrence of that continuous NMDA activation. Another thing is by activating the NMDA receptors, the activation thresholds of the mu opioid receptors will be changed and the mu opioid receptors will become less sensitive to opioids. So a patient that goes into a central sensitization state will develop a kind of tolerance to opioids and you need to uh, increase the dose significantly before you reach a clinically significant analgesic uh, effect. And finally also you see that the central sensitization state is uh, responsible for the spread of the pain symptoms. Uh, a patient has a radiotherapy in a certain body e region, but after a couple of weeks, the entire limb is painful or the entire body half is uh, painful. Well, that's due to this non-dermatosomal uh, spread of the uh, sensitization. <coughs> A last thing that I would like to mention, and that's certainly important in a lot of cancer patients, is the neurogenic inflammation 
at the site of the injury with the peripheral sensitization because that also can lead to these hypogesic states and these uh, allodynic uh, states. So what are the targets uh, for uh, pharmacological treatment? Well, you can work at the level of the peripheral nervous uh, system with the NSAIDs, uh, for example, of with the local anesthetics. I will talk about them shortly. Um, certainly a very interesting target point is the spinal cord with the dorsal horn, where different types of drugs will uh, interact. And then finally, also at the level of the somatosensory cortex. We don't have many targets there. The SSRIs or the SNRIs are important there, but sometimes also on the psychotic drugs will be used to interact at this level. And if you take this complicated picture and translate it to the different uh, drugs that are available, you will see that we can target the periphery with the local anesthetics, with the NSAIDs, but certainly also more and more with the topical treatment uh, options. You can work on the peripheral nerves with the local anesthetics and also the application of capsaicin. You can target the dorsal horn with certainly the opioids, the gabapentinoids, the um, uh, tricyclic antidepressant drugs. We more and more work on the descending inhibitor control system, which if we activate this system, we will decrease the intensity of the transmission. And for example, tapentadol will interact here. And then finally, you have the brain, the somatosensory cortex, with certainly the SSRIs and the SNRIs. So if we start at the level of the peripheral nervous uh, system, well, you have the local anesthetics uh, through injection, through iontophoresis, but certainly also more and more through the application of the Versatis patches, so the lidocaine patches that can be applied after radiotherapy, after a wound incision, after a uh, post-hepatic neuralgia uh, or in case of a post-hepatic uh, neuralgia. The big advantage is, is of course that it has no systemic uh, side effects, there is no systemic absorption, so you can easily use it together with other uh, drugs and it will shut down the um, processing of the signal in the local uh, or in the peripheral nerves. There are other um, drugs that can be used uh, in the periphery, and that's certainly the capsaicin. Eh? The cutensa patches, so that very high dose, 8% uh, capsaicin patches, can be used in even very large peripheral neuropathic pain syndrome, even bilateral uh, syndromes. It can be applied uh, throughout the entire body for uh, exception of the uh, face. It's a special patch and you can apply up to four patches at the same time. You have to apply it during 30 to 60 minutes. It's quite painful. Eh? The first 10-50 minutes it's okay, but then you, you have the penetration of the capsaicin and it induces a very uh, intense burning feeling. Eh? So during the application you need to administer uh, analgesics to calm down uh, the patient. Eh? But the interesting thing is there are no systemic side effects. The burning feeling disappears after 12 hours after the application and it induces an analgesic effect for three to four months. Eh? So a chronic pain patient can be treated two, three times a year with the capsaicin uh, patch. In the beginning, there was some concern that a repeated long-term application of capsaicin would induce some neurodegenerative uh, changes, but we have now six, seven years uh, of clinical experience and we don't see these changes and we see that we have a continuous uh, analgesic uh, effect. Um, Can you ask questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. The, it creates analgesia. Does it increase the sensory deficit? No, 
No, because it works only on the C fibers uh, and not on the A delta fibers. So you don't in, uh, induce any hyposensitive or hyperalgesic effect. Uh, there is no loss of sensory function. There is no uh, motor deficit that uh, develops. So even on both feet, you can use it. And even immediately after the application, there is no motor deficit, there is no change in proprioception or, or anything. There is only a very intense neurogenic inflammation that occurs during the application uh, and you have to instruct the patient that they have to cool down the, the treated skin area with ice during a couple of uh, hours. The morning after you don't see anything anymore and the analgesic effect is already uh, in there. The problem is, is that it's, it needs some uh, skills by the nurses to apply it. If you just handle the, uh, the patch with your uh, hands or with normal gloves, latex gloves, then the capsaicin penetrates also your skin. And, and you don't do that three times a day then. Even if you walk into the room and they are manipulating the capsaicin patch, the capsaicin gets airborne and if you inhale, you will feel your lungs burning. So it needs some, uh, some uh, skills. Currently, there is no reimbursement in Belgium for the cutensa, but luckily the KCE with the pragmatic trials uh, accepted our proposal for what we call the Pelican uh, trial, where we are going to compare the topical uh, lidocaine with the topical capsaicin with Lyrica as a, a control group in the broad indication of localized uh, neuropathic pain, so also in oncological uh, conditions. Uh, finally, the last the trial is activated. Uh, will be activated beginning of September, um, and it's in twelve uh, centers throughout Belgium that uh, the, it will be activated. The NSAIDs, NSAID, well, all, you you all know it. Uh, perhaps the big indication of the the only indication for um, acetylsalicylsur uh, in pain is the treatment of bone metastasis. I, I see a lot of patients who are treated with NSAID, buprenorphine or naproxen, uh, and they are not quite uh, comfortable. Well, the best indication is the acetylsalicylsur, uh, I'm going to say it in, in Dutch because I always fall over the term, uh, because it has the best bone penetration and that's for us the only indication, analgesic indication for this drug, but it's certainly superior to all existing classical uh, NSAIDs. If we move up now and we go to the dorsal horn, well then of course you have the big class of uh, opioids eh? and like I already said there is a quite different clinical profile. Eh? A lot of people think that all opioids are, are equal to each other or all the same, but basically you have to distinguish three major types. And that's first the buprenorphine and the methadone. Then you have the big group, I would say, with the classical uh, opioids. And then you have the new group of the tapentadol. And why is there a difference? Well, that's due to their effect on the different opioid receptors. Uh, the, the second group, uh, the ones with the morphine, fentanyl, oxycodone, hydromorphone, they <coughs> almost only interact on the mu opioid receptors. Uh, and I showed you in the first or in the second slide that in a lot of cancer patients, the opioid receptors or the, the sensibility, sensitivity of the opioid receptors is decreased due to the hypogesic and uh, allodinic effect of the NMDA receptor activation. So the efficacy of interaction with the mu opioid receptors is decreased in a lot of cancer patients. So it becomes much more interesting if you can interact with the other 
opioid receptors, the kappa, the delta, or the uh, nociceptin uh, opioid receptors. But most of the classical opioids only interact with this one. And it's only the buprenorphine and the methadone that interacts with also with the other ones. So there are a lot of conditions where either buprenorphine, either methadone becomes the first choice or the first opioid uh, in, in line. Certainly also in some pain types where there is a activation of these opioid receptors like in neuropathic pain, well, a lot of people say neuropathic pain doesn't uh, interact or doesn't respond to opioids. Well, that's not the case. It responds to opioids, but you need much higher doses of opioids, and it responds much better if you use opioids that also interact with the other opioid receptor types. Methadone has another mode of action and that's the inhibition of the NMDA receptor. So methadone is the only opioid that beside its effect, its classical effect on the opioid receptors will also exert an inhibitory effect on the uh, NMDA receptors. So methadone is really a very interesting opioid drug in uh, oncological uh, conditions eh? and that's why it's a pity that there is only one um, um, condition available eh? uh, or you need to have magistral uh, prescriptions eh? and then you can work with your own doses and your own administration. The problem with the methadone is that it has a very long half-life. It's 72 hours, so you have to be very careful with changing the dose. You can only change the dose every four or five days, so there is a very slow titration with the methadone. Buprenorphine, I don't know if you use it a lot, the Temgesico, the Transtec, is really, in, in our sense, the first uh, choice and uh, you can start with the sublingual administration with them to see if there are side effects and to taper the the daily dose and then you can switch to the three days uh, transdermal administration with uh, the transtec and probably uh, before the end of the year there were, there will be seven day patches that become available so then it's it use of the ease of use for the patient is really uh, important. And you, you prefer the transtec to the fentanyl patch? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Certainly in oncological situation and certainly also due to the fact that the treatment with opioid is prolonged. It becomes longer and longer and then with the classical opioids, if it's morphine, if it's oxycodone, if it's uh, uh, fentanyl, you get the problem of the opioid-induced hypoalgesia, yeah, which is much less with uh, the buprenorphine. The tolerance development with buprenorphine is much less. Yeah. So if, if you embark on a long-term treatment, buprenorphine or methadone are, are the first choices. With really. methadone, you also use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a lot. The, uh, the uh, conditioning. Uh, no, no. Well. In, in children, we only use methadone. We never use another drug. It's always methadone that we use. Um, but also in a lot of uh, adults, certainly if we see that there is a lot of neuropathic pain or that there is a very important central sensitization, I will start with methadone. I will never start with another uh, opioid drug. And how do you diagnose the central well, if, if you see eh, that a patient has a very important allodynia, eh, if the non-noxious uh, stimuli will induce pain, well, that's your hallmark of a central sensitization. Eh? And then you don't have to bother with drugs that act peripherally eh, with NSAID of local anesthetic. The problem is already in the central uh, nervous system and then you have to interact at the level of the of the dorsal horn or through the uh, descending inhibitory system. Um, and just 
to go a little bit further into the opioid uh, treatment, eh, that's basically the algorithm of an opioid treatment, eh, where you start with identifying the type of pain. Eh, and there is a, a 1 to 100 rule. Eh, if you need 1 milligram of an opioid to treat a somatic pain syndrome, you need 10 milligrams to treat a visceral pain syndrome, you need 100 milligrams to treat a neuropathic pain uh, syndrome. Eh? So if you identify the patient with a visceral pain or with a neuropathic pain, well, these are not the, the patients to start with on opioids. You need to induce or start with other treatment options and then move on to uh, opioids in much lower doses. Eh? Certainly always look at alternatives. Eh? And what I mean by alternatives is not really adjuvants, but look at the weak opioid uh, drugs, at the tramadol, the tilidine, uh, the nefupam, for example. Uh, they are not; they are underused, really, in in Belgium. Eh? We go from step one to step three, and then we embark on a long-term treatment with step three, and we run into problems of tolerance of opioid uh, uh, hypoalgesia. We should stay at the second stage in combination with adjuvant drug but longer, much longer stay on the second stage with the weak opioids and even in between the weak opioids <coughs> you can rotate, you can rotate from tramadol to nephopam to uh, tilidine uh, retard. If this is not sufficient enough then really move to the strong uh, opioids where and this is also overlooked frequently, where you continuously have to assess and reassess the patient. Eh? Is there still a good uh, efficacy of the opioid uh, treatment? Is there no development of tolerance or hypogesic uh, state? And does the patient really need the opioids? Can we taper down or can we even de-prescribe the opioid uh, treatment? Eh? And on what basis do you reassess the patient? Well, that's the six A's of pain treatment. Eh? Is there still an analgesic efficacy? Does it in positively impact the activities of daily living? What with the side effects? Eh? Is there good balance between analgesia and side effects? Are there no signs of uh, aberrant drug taking behavior, so abusive uh, disorders? Uh, assess the, the patient and continue to assess the patient and certainly have some treatment plan and eh? where do we have to uh, go into the future what our, is our purpose of starting with the opioid uh, therapy eh? um, and certainly periodically review the, the uh, opioid uh, treatment and we see that a lot of opioid treatments are initiated but that there is not enough assessment or reassessment and that patients continue on a very long term and never the question is asked shouldn't we taper down shouldn't we change to another drug or to another uh, uh, opioid and what is the side effect profile of the uh, opioid uh, treatment a lot of discussion is going on what is the clinically meaningful analgesic effect? Eh? When is a in is a, a analgesic therapy really <coughs> efficacious? Eh? And that depends a little bit about the intensity of the pain. Eh? If you have a moderate intensity, let's say six out of ten, well then a decrease of 40, 45 percent is uh, fine and is clinically meaningful. Eh? If you have a very severe pain, then you really need to have a decrease in pain of more than 50%. Eh? You will see that in the literature, and that's always uh, within the Risi Vinami, the, the problem uh, in literature, you will see in clinical studies that a 30% reduction is considered as being good. Eh? And then they ask for a reimbursement, while we clearly know that this is not clinically meaningful for the patient, you really have to go to the 50% or higher as a clinically meaningful reduction in uh, pain. Yeah. This 
I will not go into detail, but this is the big problem now. A lot of the patients that are considered as yeah, abuse of uh, opioids are not really abusing the opioids, but either have a problem of tolerance and they have lost their sensitivity to the opioid treatment or they developed an opioid induced hypoxesic state. These are the patients where you increase the dose and the patient is fine for a couple of weeks and then he or she comes back and say pain is back and whatever you do if you increase well if I'm honest it gets worse it doesn't get better it gets worse and these are the patients with an opioid induced hypoxesia and then you really have to stop further increasing the dose of the opioids you have to rotate them to another opioid molecule and decrease the dose by 30 to 50 percent and we did a study with the RISIF and we see that opioid rotation is almost never done in Belgium. We start increasing and increasing and we end up at very high doses after two, three, four years and then we get stuck and we see a patient that, that tells you well I take oxycodone, I have the fentanyl patch, it, it doesn't really work, but you know what works? That's the paracetamol that I take four times a day. And everybody says, that's impossible. And you have a hundred micrograms of uh, fentanyl, you have oxycodone, and then the paracetamol works and is the only effective drug. Well, that's the sign of an opioid induced uh, hypogesia. It's kind of toxicity, uh, toxicity syndrome by the uh, uh, opioids and if you administer then more opioids the pain will effectively get uh, worse so you really have to taper down the uh, opioids eh? and you really have to start a opioid uh, rotation it's often not that simple it's a week of, of very dis well, very pronounced discomfort for uh, the patient that later on you will see that the patient is much more comfortable at a very uh, or much lower doses of uh, opioids. How do you do it? Well, basically you, you calculate, and I showed you here, you calculate the EG analgesic potency. Let's, for example, say you have a patient on transdermal uh, fentanyl 50 micrograms uh, an hour, eh? you want to rotate to uh, oxycodone, that would mean that you have 60 milligrams on 24 hour base. Well, you rate, rotate it and you decrease the dose of oxycodone with 30 to 50 percent. Eh? So you start the patient on an oxycodone dose of 30 to 40 milligrams a day. Eh? That's how you do the, the rotation. The problem is that if you look in, in textbooks or even if you look on the internet, you have many different conversion tables and there is not one straightforward uh, conversion. But this one, and you're happy to use it uh, or to look at it, this one is, to my opinion, the best one that is uh, available. Okay, you don't have the constant. No, no, no. Well, in all of the conversions, the you almost never see the buprenorphine or the uh, the methadone. There are some of them uh, because the 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 problem of the tolerance is much smaller. The tolerance and the opioid induced hypalgesia is really a mu opioid receptor problem. It's a toxicity yeah, due to the mu opioid receptor. But you don't use it as a rotator option. Oh, well, I, I mostly use it before this. Uh, I try to stick with the buprenorphine or even we rotate between buprenorphine and methadone before I go to this one. So uh, I have not many patients on the classical uh, uh, opioid drugs. I stick with them in the, the weak opioids for as long as I can and then go to the buprenorphine and the methadone kind of as a bridge between step two and step uh, three. Um, what, is the, what is the limit for, for the, the appearance of uh, 
the opioid induced hyperalgesia, well, it probably differs from patient to patient, but there are some literature and some studies that indicate that if you have a patient on a thousand milligrams of morphine on a daily doses, that's kind of the cutoff. Eh? Now, if you see, eh, it can appear, but if you see, then you are probably at uh, um, about uh, 200 or 250 milli uh, micrograms of transdermal fentanyl. Eh? And so a lot of patients, if you, if you combine the transdermal fentanyl with oxycodone of oxidome, will reach that uh, limit. So there are probably a lot of patients that indeed suffer from this opioid-induced hyperalgesic uh, state. You're probably familiar with it, but these two problems related to opioids are uh, in becoming increasingly aware eh, that opioids have a depressive uh, effect on the immunological function and are even linked now to the reappearance or the, uh, the uh, reoccurrence of uh, tumors. And, and oncological syndromes, but they certainly exert a depressive effect on uh, many of the neuroendocological functions. So long-term treatment with uh, opioids can indeed have a negative impact on the oncological state of uh, patients. This is the new group, the, the tapentadol. Uh, what is the tapentadol? It's a combination of an effect on the mu opioid receptor, but only 5 to 10 percent. And 90 uh, percent of its clinical effect is on the uh, descending inhibitory system. So it will increase the availability of noradrenaline in the uh, central nervous system and therefore it will continuously activate the uh, descending inhibitory system. And so the main analgesic effect of tabentadol is through the activation of the noradrenergic system. That has two main advantages. First of all, you don't have the classical opioid side effects. You don't have the constipation, you don't have the sedation, for example. You don't have the respiratory depression. Second, it doesn't have the side effects of the tramadol. Because tramadol basically does the same. A very small opioid effect and a very pronounced effect on, on the descending inhibitory system, but then through the serotonergic pathway. It activates the DIC to the release of serotonin. Eh? And that's why a lot of patients have nausea, vomiting on tramadol, because serotonin also activates the brain, um, uh, the drag uh, center, the, 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 the nausea uh, center. Eh? And that's why they developed the tapentadol. It has absolutely no serotonergic effect. It's noradrenergic effect. So it has a very interesting side effect uh, profile. It also indicates that tapentadol is also useful in certainly the neuropathic pain states and has a much better efficacy in neuropathic pain states than, for example, the classical mu opioid uh, receptor agonist. Eh? What is the problem? Probably, well, that's that continuous release of uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Eh? Uh, I've participated in a couple of uh, studies. Uh, some of my patients ended up in the emergency room with supraventricular tachycardias. Eh? In Germany, there is some concern about the behavioral changes or even development of aggressive behavior in patients under treatment with tapentadol. So, well, it's better than a lot of, of the classical opioids, but you see the appearance of some distinguished uh, typical uh, side effects of the tapentadol. Blockers of the uh, sympathetic. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, but it's uh, apparently that I I know that there is one study who tried it and they saw a lot of side effects, so they, it didn't work well. Uh, it's most important then to taper down or to decrease a little bit the the dose of the tapentadol. Uh, what is interesting, you have both long-acting uh, forms in different doses. It goes from uh, 50 milligrams up to 250 milligrams and also short acting uh, forms in three different uh, forms. So you can really combine long acting drugs with short acting uh, doses of tapentadol. Currently it's reimbursed as a second line. Eh? If strong opioids failed, either due to side effects, either due to uh, analgesic uh, or and in uh, analgesic uh, inefficacy, so that the, the patient didn't have enough of uh, pain uh, release. If you rotate from a classical uh, opioid to tapentadol, you have to be careful because you don't have any saturation anymore of the op opioid receptor. So never stop oxycodone and start tapentadol because your patient will go into an abstinence. A syndrome from one moment to the other there is no saturation anymore of the opioid receptor so you have to decrease the dosing of oxycodone of transdermal uh, fentanyl for five days or one week and then at the same time you increase the dose of the fentanyl and then you can do a opioid rotation without any side effects here also the conversion is a little bit difficult in the literature. You see that uh, if you have a, a dose of uh, tapentadol and compare it to the dose of morphine, the dose of tapentadol is three times higher than the dose of uh, morphine. Eh? But in clinically uh, situations, I always uh, use this um, IK analgesic dose, 20 milligrams of oxycodone. Uh, is the same as 100 milligrams of tapentadol equals 40 milligrams of uh, morphine. So uh, basically there is a 1 in 5 combination with the oxycodone. So it's less potent than the classical uh, opioid analgesics. That's for the opioids. I will move on to a second other class that also exerts its action at the level of the dorsal horn, and that's, uh, of course, the gabapentin, which, like we always said, it can interact with the NMDA receptors, can shut down the NMDA receptors and decrease the release of neurotransmitters. Uh, what is the clinical use? Well, in combination with uh, opioids, because it certainly exerts a very powerful opioid reducing effect. Eh? Even in a somatic pain state, if you combine a gabapentinoid with a opioid, you can easily decrease by 50, 60 percent the dose of the opioid to that opioid um, uh, saving effect. And certainly in your hepatic pain syndromes, well, this is the first line therapy. And later on, if uh, insufficient, you will add some opioids uh, to it. Okay. The descending inhibition uh, system, well, you can work with tramadol, you can work with uh, tapentadol now, but there are two additional drugs that you can use. That's clonidine. Uh, it has also an opioid saving uh, effect. The big problem with clonidine is the sedative effect. Uh, even in very low doses, you see a pronounced uh, sedation. There is another problem, and it's you, you almost never read it anywhere, but clonidine induces or can induce very pronounced depressive uh, effects. Uh, if you have a patient with chronic pain and is very depressed, always look if there is not even a low dose of clonidine, stop it and in a lot of cases you will see the disappearance of the depressive uh, effect. Uh, what we use is the dexmetidomidine, I don't know if you're familiar with it, the dexto, it's only an IV administration and we use it in very 
pronounced uh, syndrome of central sensitization and patients that after chemotherapy have pain all over the uh, body with the tingling, the pricking uh, sensation, we use Dexter uh, infusions. It's an entire day that we administer Dexter under continuous uh, hemodynamic uh, monitoring and you kind of induce a pharmacological coma. coma. Uh, what is the dose? Well, it depends from patient to patient. Uh, Dextor like clonidine will induce bradycardia, and we we taper our doses until the bradycardia becomes a problem, uh, and then we administer it for uh, up to eight hours. It has a very long acting analgesic efficacy. We have patients who three times a year come back for a Dextor infusion and then they have for months a analgesic uh, effect. I need some experience with that. Yeah, well the on intensive care they, they know it, they use it for the you sedation it has become. There, yeah, well no, no, we do it on our daycare uh, ward, but you need a continuous hemodynamic monitoring eh? and you need a continuous adjustment of the, uh, the dosing. Eh? It's also the same, we, we, we use a lot of, of IV infusions, eh? either with Dexter, either with lidocaine, either with uh, ketamine, uh, but you need to have a continuous monitoring of, of the patient eh? for the dextor with the bradycardia, for the lidocaine with the uh, or the occurrence of uh, arrhythmias, with the ketamine with possible uh, development of hallucinations. Eh? Uh, so these are certainly not first line uh, choices, but in a lot of patients with uh, therapy resistant uh, pain syndromes, we will uh, use it. Uh, on a normal day, we have 50 to 60 patients on an IV lidocaine uh, infusion, uh, and they return every 8 to 12 uh, weeks for the treatment, uh, and it allows them to taper down significantly the dose of other uh, analgesics. Uh, we always think that lidocaine has only a very short action. Uh, but you have to, to distinguish the fact that now lidocaine works on a pathological pain symptom. Pain symptom. You have a, a patient where the NMDA receptors are activated, where the AMPA receptors are activated, they have a generalized uh, hypogesic state or allodynic state, and in these cases with a pathological somatosensory system, the lidocaine has a much longer analgesic uh, effect. We could use even longer acting local anesthetics, but then you run into the problem of the cardiac toxicity, so we always stick to the lidocaine. Why ketamine? Well, ketamine is basically the only real uh, NMDA receptor antagonist, and that's the most selective uh, one, but you always have to combine it with very low doses of uh, Dormicum or another benzodiazepine, because otherwise you get the hallucination uh, side effects. And what we would like to have is an oral treatment of, of ketamine or another um, NMDA receptor antagonist, but all our treatment uh, with ketamine is very difficult. Um, there is no sustainability of the oral solutions, so people really don't like it, and the taste is awful. So after two days, they throw away the the ketamine. So this last strategy is the previous one. That's something you manage in the user, yeah, not the oncologist. No, no, uh, but. Well, we work together with them, and if yeah. if they have the first yeah. stages, and you see that the efficacy is not enough, then we will move on to these uh, stages. But we have more and more that they make already the indication, and they say this is a good one for the intravenous lidocaine. Uh, what we do, we do two administrations in trial. Uh, the first administration is two milligrams per kilograms over 90 minutes. And then they go home afterwards, eh? so it's two-hour uh, treatment and they go home. 
Um, the second administration, three weeks later, is with three to four milligrams uh, per kilogram. And if we see that they have an analgesic effect, that they don't have any uh, side effects, then we will start on a prolonged uh, treatment options. And I have patients who, after 10 years, still come back for every eight or 10 uh, weeks. So that's a proof that they really have some uh, analgesic effect. And then the last stages, that's of course the brain. Eh? We don't have that many uh, uh, options. Eh? You have the SSRIs. Well, from an analgesic standpoint, you can forget all of the SSRIs. Eh? They are largely inferior to all other treatment options. You have the SS SNRIs that perform a little bit better, the Venla vaccine, but it's less and less used. Uh, the duloxetine certainly has a uh, analgesic uh, efficacy, but the best one are still the DCAs, uh, the amitriptyline or the nortriptyline. Uh, you can't beat them. Uh, and why can't you beat them? They are called the dirty drugs. Well, if you look at their interaction, they kind of interact at every stage of the pain si signaling. It's one drug that combines the seven steps of the pain signaling pathway, and that's probably why they are so uh, powerful. Uh, you can use them as a kind of opioid. Uh, if you don't have any lidocaine and you have to stitch uh, a wound, you can inject uh, amitriptyline. It works perfectly as a local anesthetic. Uh, and they are developing now patches containing the uh, amitriptyline to have a another uh, topical treatment uh, options. Yeah. I'm not going to mention this a lot, uh, but don't forget that a lot of patients have also an autonomic dysregulation. Yeah. Certainly the patients with a neuropathic pain state after chemotherapy, in a lot of cases, they have also an autonomic dysregulation that will further increase their pain state. It's not easy to treat it pharmacologically. Basically, you have to do injections with local anesthetics uh, at the different sympathetic ganglia to treat it. But it's just that you don't forget it when you uh, uh, do a evaluation of, of the patient. And this is my last slide. Well, treatment of pain, certainly in oncological conditions, it's always a multimodal approach, not only within the pharmacology, but also abroad. You need to have interventional treatment options. In a lot of cases, you need also the psychotherapy. And pain treatment is often by the individual patient. Is there a hypogesic state? If there, is there an allodynic state? If there is a very pronounced peripheral sensitization uh, state. So it's really difficult to do pain treatment by the protocol. It's almost always by the individual case of uh, the patient. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that lecture was a real eye-opener for me at least. For me as well. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, we have 15 minutes to spend per patient. A lot of patients have pain, mm -hmm. but we cannot afford to go deeply into the patient. So the uh, optimal situation would be that there is a pain specialist sitting next to us to, uh, you know, to guide us. In, in so well, that's not always possible. Eh? What, not what, possible. what would be important is if you're stuck with a patient yeah. that you can mm -hmm. transfer them. And then we have a problem in the pain center that our waiting uh, uh, times are, are too high. So we developed a, a, a rapid sequence for oncological uh, patients that they can be seen within the next seven days. Uh, but you don't, in a lot of cases, you don't need any pain specialist. Uh, if you 
talk with the patient for five minutes and the anamnesis is the most important in pain. And if they have some hypogesic symptoms, if they have allodynic uh, symptoms, if they have the pins and needles, if they have the hypersensitivity, well, you know at what level the problem is and you already know how you have to, to, to treat it. And I always say if a patient was fine on a treatment and then it doesn't work and you change it and it still doesn't work, you have to ask yourself three questions. Am I treating the correct type of pain? Perhaps I started with a somatic pain but there is now an involvement of nerves, eh? metastasis into a nerve, you have a neuropathic pain, or there is an involvement in the viscera and you have a visceral pain syndrome. Eh? Am I still treating the correct type of pain? The second question is, is my route of administration still effective? Uh, we see a lot of patients in palliative phases or more advanced stages where they s still continue to use transdermal roots but they are cachectic they don't have any circulation of blood anymore into the skin it doesn't work anymore you, you remove the patch with the fentanyl or the buprenorphil still in it and you have to change your route of administration then and the third one the big question is are you not into a opioid induced hypogesic state and then by further increasing you are doing harm because you really induce a neurotoxicity you have to decrease the dose and rotate to another opioid that's the three main questions you didn't speak about anti-inflammatory NSAIDs, I mentioned uh, them, okay. I mentioned Sorry. them, yeah. but there is no big use for them, eh? it's, it's only in somatic <coughs> pain, eh? bone metastasis, and then the classical NSAIDs, I never use them, eh? I use the acetyl salicylzure, eh? that's my main uh, indication. In visceral pain, okay, but then in acute visceral pain syndromes, eh? if you have a colic crisis, uh, then I use it, but not in prolonged physical pain, I will never use it. Eh? Then I will go to the, uh, the drugs that act on the descending inhibitory system. Eh? For example, the venlafaxine, my main use of venlafaxine is in chronic physical pain syndromes. Eh? Then I use the venlafaxine in 150 or 300 milligrams so that I get dopaminergic uh, effect. Uh, but in neuropathic pain, for example, I never use NSAIDs. So I think I use NSAIDs in, in one patient a week, even less. And when you have like a little few patches and the patient gets worse and you have to change him over to um, intravenous medication, for example, how do you handle this? Because I don't think it doesn't exist in intravenous... It, it exists, eh? You have them, them hesic in uh, 0.4 milligrams per... Uh, it's milliliter or 2 milliliter, but it's almost <coughs> never uh, used. Eh? There is a misunderstanding. Eh? A lot of people think that it saturates the mu opioid receptor so that the patient is not responsive anymore to classical opioids. Eh? But that's not the case. Eh? So there's only a very small saturation of the mu opioid receptor. So you can stay with the transtec, for example, and add IV fentanyl or IV morphine uh, to it, and you will have a synergistic uh, effect. Okay? Uh, and if then the patient becomes too sedated, then you can decrease the dosing of the transtec. But for example, in, in cancer patients who need the surgical procedures, we leave the transtec there. We never change it and we add the classical mu opioid receptors on top of it during the perioperative uh, stage and then we go back to the buprenorphine uh, treatment. That's why you, you almost never have respiratory depression with buprenorphine because it 
uh, in a very low dose, about 35 micrograms uh, per hour dosing, you already reach the maximum saturation of the new opioid receptor. So if you increase, you don't have any increase of respiratory depression, which you have with the other opioid uh, uh, receptor agonists. The constipation, so you have uh, used analgesics uh, for pink uh, alcaloids, for example, which is very sensitive uh, neurological pain, and then you, that's already sympathetic, causing autonomous uh, dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And then you add your analgesic, you increase that problem. Mm -hmm. How do you manage? Well, obstipation, uh, when I start, certainly with a, well, I try to stick with the, the weak opioids and then I don't have or I almost never have the problem with the obstipation. If I move to a uh, strong opioids, then I immediately start with uh, osmotic laxatives. Um, I never wait until the patient starts reporting problems. When we switch to a, a, a strong opioid, we will start, even in a very low dose, we will start with a laxative. Um, and you even have to do it when, for example, you combine a gabapentin or pregabalin with a low dose opioids because they, it will exert a synergistic effect and the obstipation can be very pronounced even with low doses. So we have a lot of patients where we use a laxative as a, as a background uh, therapy. And what's your preferred laxative in this context? Mine, it's, it's the osmotics one. Uh, it's the, 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 the syrup with lactulose. Never do colax, uh, never something that stimulates the intestines because you have the opioids that decrease the motility and then you have another one that increases the motilities and you will get cramps. So I always lose the use the osmotic laxatives. No Movicol. Yeah. yeah. Movicol or, or lactulose. Yeah. Well it's a it's a kind of osmotic. It's a second step osmotic drug. It's so complex. In the postgraduate program next year, the use of the last session. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, uh, it's not taught at that level. Uh, no, 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 it's. Uh, we, we in the, at the University of Antwerp, uh, at the first master year, they have. Uh, two weeks of training, anesthesia and uh, pain treatment. So it's basically 14 hours of pain that they get. But you see, if you then go uh, third master, uh, a lot is, is forgotten yeah, already. It doesn't stick in. No, because it's very subtle. subtle. Yeah. You need to, to practice it. Yeah. 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 A daily basis. I think that it's uh, kind of uh, anguishing to have a patient with a high dose of morphine and then to tell them, no, you stop and you, you decrease and you use something else. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I admit I am afraid then, uh, I would be afraid that my patient has then more pain because I... I uh, yeah, but you can, if, if, you, if you have the feeling we have a problem here, eh? There's always the two questions, is it tolerance or is it hypoalgesia? Yeah. And then what I say, I say we increase the dose a last time. Yeah. Uh, if it's tolerance, the patient will tell you it's better. But after a couple of weeks, it will fade away. Yeah. But then you know, okay, we can go to another opioid drug and we don't, there is no rush. Yeah. We can taper down one drug, taper up the other drug. Eh? And we don't really have to decrease the, the dose. Eh? If 
it's really a problem of hyperalgesia, the patient will tell you it didn't do anything. Eh? If I'm honest with you, it got worse. Eh? And then you have to tell them, okay, you have a one last final dose of your classical opioid. The next morning we switch to another one. And for a week you give them uh, fast-acting uh, medication as a backup. And for example, if you have a patient uh, on oxy oxycodone, the long-acting, there is a hypogesic state, you want to change to uh, transdermal fentanyl or to hydromorphone and the paladone, uh, I give them oxynom for one week as a rescue medication. And they can freely taper up with the oxynom, or oxynom as a backup. And it works fine in two, three. And what is really important is the one of the big problems with the the opioid-induced toxicity is the dehydration of the of the brain. So you tell the patient that during that week they drink a lot, four to five liters a day, and it will decrease their symptoms immediately because it's really a dehydration effect of of the brain. And in very, if the patient is, is uh, hospitalized, we give them IV fluids and we change it in, in two, three days. And the withdrawal syndrome is not the issue when you shift? No, no, because it's an oversaturation of the opioid receptors. Uh, if, if, of course, you stop one opioid and you don't give anything else, well, then they will go into an abstinence. Uh, and probably in an hypergesic state, they will go to epilepsy eh, because you will further increase the toxicity. Eh. But if you administer another molecule in a lower dose, well, the opioid receptors are still saturated and there is no abstinence uh, syndrome. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Only like the last question uh, that will be the score tonight. <laughs> 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 two, two. <laughs> can you probably get the slides, please? Yeah, yeah. You, you can have it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Ik heb misschien wat te veel bewogen. Ja, dat komt zo goed. Thank you. 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 Whoa.